You want to know what's funny? If I don't put up one of these reviews in like every three days or so, I constantly have Uchibits asking me, where's the Berserk review at? I'm not joking. I've had a bunch of Uchibits say, where's the next Berserk volume review at? And so today, I'm going to bring it to you. The only reason why I don't put up so many Berserk reviews one after another is because I just want to take it at a slow pace. I want to read Berserk at a slow pace. I want to cherish the series and enjoy it for what it is. And I just don't want to spam all of you with a bunch of berserk reviews one after another that's pretty much it i just want to space them out individually so anyways today i want to be reviewing volume 10 of berserk hard to believe i finally made it to volume 10 of berserk who would have guessed now this volume sets up a lot a lot and it's badass so 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 badass okay I'm going to tell you something that's badass about this. Very, very badass. And it would probably be this scene right here. Guts impels that torturer. That scene right there is very, very brutal. But that is what I love about Berserk. Berserk goes over the top with its gore and violence, its darkness. It is so good and it builds up this dramatic atmosphere about it when you read the manga. It, that is how great Berserk's atmosphere, it pours out of this manga. You could feel like the darkness and the evil coming out of the panels, and that is something I really cherish. And when I was reading this entire section right here, but you saw the torturer talking about what he did to Griffith, I was like, that is so sick. That is disgusting, and that is just so s disgusting. I, seriously, like, he, he literally cut the tendons of Griffith, cut off his, like, tendons, like his arm tendons, his leg tendons, where he couldn't run or walk away or anything or fight back. And then if Griffith wouldn't eat, he would put him in boiling water and, like, he would peel his skin off, take off his toenails and peel some of his skin. I was like, dude, that is fucked up. That is so fucked up. It is just so nasty. And what is even worse than that when you find that out is just he took off Griffith's tongue. He took Griffith's tongue off, and this sick bastard wears Griffith's tongue around his neck like a souvenir. This is like some Game of Thrones type shit when you would see someone like wear around someone's hand or something around their neck because they have a trophy. That is just so screwed up on so many levels. And Griffith has been tortured for an entire year. He's dealt with an entire year of this shit. Kaneki. Okay, I want to reference something, okay? Kaneki went under torture for 10 days and became what he did in 10 days, okay? In the manga series of Tokyo Ghoul. Griffith has had worse torture than what Kaneki had to go through for an entire year. Kaneki only had 10 days. Imagine the level of torture Griffith as a character or as a person just went through this entire year. Yeah, it's hell. I don't even want to imagine what he went through. That's how bad it is, because if you were having your skin filleted off and cut off slowly when you wouldn't eat, and every time you tried to not eat or you wanted to die, they would do that to you, or if you wanted to bite your tongue off to die, you couldn't do that, because they already cut it off, and they probably burnt it to where the wound would close up. So, right there, Griffith is in probably one of the worst situations you could probably ever ask for in the medieval days, and so for him to probably go crazy as a god hand, turn into the god hand, is very understandable now, it is so understandable because, like I said, if Tokyo Ghoul could show Kaneki going that fucking crazy in just 10 days, I can't imagine what Griffith is going to do. I, I don't even want to know how much rage, how much evil he has built up into him, how much vengeance, how much sadness, how much heartbreak he has in him, just so much feelings he probably has. Like, he even states in this right here, in this uh, panel, like this page, he states like the only light that's keeping him alive is Guts. Guts is like taking uh, taking over his dream. For instance, Guts is now Griffith's dream. That's exactly what it is. He's like, now when he compares his old dream of wanting a kingdom to Guts, Guts makes the kingdom he, like he wanted as a dull toy. That's exactly what it was. And to see how Griffith said this with his little bit of a backstory, it's really shocking how he's managed to cling on to life. What really scares me about this, though, when I'm reading this panel, or this, this section of the volume, is that it's like malice, friendship, jealousy, regret, tenderness, sorrow, pain, hunger. So many 
reoccurring yearning feelings. That uh, giant swirl of violent emotions in which none are definite, but all implied. That alone is the bond which keeps my consciousness from fading amidst the numbness. That's what Griffith said. And pretty much... It states he is at that level. I don't know what point in time this takes place in the year time skip. It could be like six months in. It could be towards the end of the year. I don't know. But Griffith is in a state of just torment. He is just downright in a state of torment. And what makes it even worse when you see this is that, like, he doesn't realize how much time has passed. He can't, he can't see any lights. He, like, he doesn't even know if he's retained his sanity in this panel. Like, he doesn't even know if he still has his sanity anymore. And when you're questioning your sanity, that's never a good sign either. And so, a lot of things are building up with Griffith. And I feel really bad. I really do. Because even though Griffith has always had this, you know, dark side to him and, you know, happy childish side to him, I don't wish this torture he went through on anyone. And so... In the acts of evil, I know he's probably going to commit very soon. I'm actually, I understand. Even though it's going to be evil, and I, I disagree with what he does. For what he went through an entire year, anyone would probably lose their sanity for what he went through as a normal human being. He's still human, no matter who he is, no matter how much he shines before everyone on the battlefield. He's still a human. And so, he still has human weaknesses. And that is really sad. It's a really sad thing what happened to Griffith. I, it really makes me sad. Because of Guts, Griffith is now in his position. If it wasn't for Guts walking out and leaving that day, Griffith wouldn't have had sex with the princess, and he wouldn't be in the situation he is locked up and tortured on the bottom of this tower. Speaking of this tower, this brings up something very, very interesting. In this volume, it talks about some backstory that is really intriguing. Let me see if I can actually find the exact panel, because it, it was a really intriguing backstory that got me. Let's see here. Right here. Okay. I want to quote this. I want to quote what exactly was stated in this section of the volume that really got me. But God finally decided he couldn't condone the Skull King's deeds and sent five angels by lightning and great earthquakes. The city was erased from the face of the earth without a trace in the span of a night. There is the entire picture right there. If you look at that right now, that's the picture of the kingdom. Like, looks fire and brimstone and lightning burning. I'm guessing that signifies the, uh... Let's see, how many angels are right there? One, two... They say five angels. See, you can see five angels in the background right there. Now, I have an interesting theory about this, okay? I have an interesting theory about these five angels, which I'll get into in just a moment. But, the thing is, is the artwork of that panel is really good. And it builds up something that's very intriguing. We find out that this city that was taken down and burnt down because there was just so much, like, pleasure going on in the city, so much, I'm guessing, sin going on in the city underneath this, uh, this king called, um, Geyserich? That's his name? Geyserich is right here. This dude with the skull mask. Now, the interesting thing is, is that there's a lot of similarities to this dude, Geyserich. I think that's his name. I Hopefully I'm saying it right. There's a lot of similarities with this dude's helmet with the cover of the skull knot. A lot of similarities, okay? And it instantly makes me think that the Skull Knight or the Skull King is this dude from the past. Now, supposedly the city got burnt down because of just a lot of sin and pleasure going on to it. Probably just a lot of stuff going down, and so it got destroyed. Now, here's an interesting passage that was said here. After, you know, we find out that there's five angels that burnt the city to the ground, it states right here, weren't there four of them? Weren't there four angels? That's pretty much what is implied. Now, I want to go to an earlier volume. Volume 3 of Berserk. Now, I want you to see this real quick. This is the God Hand. Now, looking at this quickly, and just giving my theories and thoughts, fury crafting. Five. Five angels, okay? Now, necessarily, the reason why I don't think that... It was angels is because of a passage after what I just showed you in volume 10, but I'll show you in just a second. But Griffith is on here as a god hand, okay? If you look closely, there's five. Griffith is on here as a god hand. And then you have that passage right after when there was five angels revealed as weren't there only four. So if you count the god hand that's not Griffith, there's four. And that could probably signify the four angels. Even though they're demons, it could be signified as the four. And Griffith is the fifth. Or there used to be a fifth god hand before Griffith came about, and he took that spot of a long, dead god hand. That's me theorizing right now. Now, to prove this theory why I think that, okay? 
Let's go back to where that panel was where I could show you why this theory seems plausible. It's this right here. The symbol. This mark of the curse. If you look closely, that is the exact same symbol Guts has on in Volume 1, in Volume 1 through 3, pretty much. When he has that curse on his neck that detects demons, if uh, powerful demons are near him, it'll ache and hurt him, and pretty much he could possibly die if he tries to get too close to a, a powerful demon. And to see these symbols on there, they're pretty much, they're marked to be damned. They're marked to go to hell. That's pretty much what those symbols mean, and they were a sacrifice for demon kind, or the time of fate, or whatever it's called. I forget the exact phrase that the God Hand stated, but... Pretty much, these people, all of the town that was burnt and turned into fire and brimstone, have this mark in this tower. Now, this tower that's mentioned is like a seal that holds the, I guess, this burnt down town or uh, entire bastion city underground. And so, I'm guessing if this, like, tower breaks or something, then the darkness from that city will pour out, most likely demons. Interesting thing, actually, I want to talk about something. For some reason, it seems like there's not a lot of demons at all in Berserk. And now, hear me out, okay? I could be wrong. I could be 100% wrong. I haven't read past Berserk. I haven't read, like, way far into it. Remember, I'm only on volume fucking 10. But there always seems to be very powerful demons in the human world or somewhere. I don't know if there's different worlds or not, but there seems to be only very powerful demons, like iconic demons that are traveling around in the regular world, and it doesn't seem like a lot of people know who demons are, or what they are. And so what's strange and interesting is, what if this so-called eclipse that's being hinted at opens up a fracture in dimensions or worlds or whatever, and it opens up the demon world and demons pour out? I mean, could that be it? I mean, I don't know. I just, I could be completely wrong, but that's just what I'm thinking, because there has to be a reason why there's not so many demons in this series. Like, so far, after, you know, the first couple volumes, there's a bunch of demons, because that was, like, guts way off in the future, but now we're in the past, in the Golden Age, so it, I just have a lot of questions about that. Now, besides that, I do want to bring up something that really got me thinking, and it brings up and raises a lot of questions. Let me get the exact panel for I can show you this because the questions I have right now is this that you probably remember that guy that is the count the exact count from volume 1 through 3 that Guts was fighting and that was the dude that was technically trying to offer Guts as a sacrifice when we first met the God Hand now my big question is 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 this the count in the like the previous volumes is this the same person because I guess it would make sense. There's not like a 50 year gap between, I'm guessing, Guts where he is at now in the Golden Age arc to where what happened in those volumes. But is this the same count or is it a different demon? Is that a different demon? And that's just a big question because earlier on in the volume too, you get to see that like serpent dude. You know the serpent guy from the first chapter of Berserk? There was that serpent guy. I forget the exact name. But pretty much you also saw him standing above the forest earlier on in this volume. So... Like, are these the exact same demons that Guts has fought in previous volumes? Or are they different? What's interesting about this is, is you see the Skull Knight pop in and save Rickard. Hopefully I'm saying his name right. He is an absolutely massive freaking horse. Like, look at that. Look at that horse right there. Okay? And you see little Rickard, like, right there. Compare him to the horse and the Skull Knight. Look how massive he is. That horse is like giraffe or elephant size. And then don't even get me started on the Skull Knight. That's how big he is. So that's pretty fucking terrifying if you look at that. So, why did the Skull Knight save Rickard? Why? Because this is the exact words he says. Withdrawal. You shouldn't have time to amuse yourself with slaughter in a place like this. Haste is needed. Is it not? Now, the thing is, okay? The Skull Knight is obviously a major power. In, I'm guessing, with the demons, okay? Because he heard something from Zod a couple of chapters back. Remember my last one, I talked about Zod and how the Skull Knight popped up and mentioned Zod and how most likely Guts will have a prophecy. So, for these demons to listen absolutely to the Skull Knight is a pretty scary thing, a scary thing, or terrifying, because you, it's just, 
For demons to listen to him, he must be of a higher power. But how high of a power is this person? Is he a god hand? Or is he something else? And obviously he's connected to the burnt down city. You know, that I talked about earlier. So, a lot of questions. A lot, a lot of questions. Like, there's so many questions I have. Because for people to be, like, branded with that mark as demons. And them to be sacrificing the entire, like, the entire town to be sacrificed. I know you can turn into a demon if you give something up. Did the king, Geysrich, give up? his entire nation, his entire lands, to turn into that Skull Knight. Could that have been possible? So, besides that, let's go on to the next parts of this volume. What is cool is how angry Guts gets. Like, I see his rage for the first time. Absolute rage. Like, a madman's rage. He is just slaughtering people. Slaughtering people. You don't call him the Hundred Man Slayer for nothing. He, after he kills that torture, what he did to Griffith, he goes on a slaughter. He charges up that tower, killing soldier after soldier after soldier, and it is just so freaking horrific and violent. I'm like, oh my god, this is too amazing, way too amazing. And when you see him slaughtering those soldiers, just cutting through them like fucking butter, you see the blood pouring into his face, it just, it looks so crazy. And I've never seen Guts as a character like that. I mean, he literally just breaks the limit. Like, he breaks down. Like, he is going after every single soldier in his pathway. He's just, he's killing and cutting down everybody. And it just shows you how strong he is. Now, you get this one assassin group pop-up called the Bakiraka. I hope I'm saying their name right. They pop up, and for the most part, they seem deadly. They seem to have an interesting backstory for what I've seen. But they just get fucking wrecked by Guts. Guts just slaughters them. Like, it, there's no challenge. Guts just cuts them in half, and Costco cuts them in half. They're just, there's no challenge with this Assassin Guild or whatever. So, I'm not going to talk much about them because they were interesting at first, but then they just fell into the dirt or the mud where they belong. And pretty much the, the volume ends right there with this demon revealed. This demon that has, like, this dog-type face, the black dog or whatever, called, uh, let me see what his name is so I can get his exact name. Um, the black dog, don't refer to them as knots. Okay, that man is called Wald. So, I'm guessing next volume we're going to get to see this dude fight against Guts, and it's probably going to be a demon versus Guts. He looks like a demon, so he's definitely going to be fighting Guts. Overall, a very good volume. A lot of meaning in this volume, a lot of setup, interesting theories, and it makes me question, where is the position of the Skull Knight? Why is he helping out Guts? Why is Guts getting prophecies from Zod and the Skull Knight, and at the exact same time, why did the Skull Knight save Rickert in the middle of this burnt-down platoon where, you know, the entire band of Hawks were pretty much just obliterated in this volume. So why would the Skull Knight save this one lone kid? What kind of importance does this kid Rickert have later on in the series? For him to be saved by the Skull Knight, I have a lot of questions. So a lot of mysteries, a lot and a lot of mysteries... Griffith is going to the darkness. He's called the Prince at the beginning. So, so many questions. I, I can't wait to read the next volume. I'm loving Berserk so much. And if I had to rate this volume, I'd give it a 9.5 out of 10. Very fucking good volume. So gritty. And can't wait. So tell me your thoughts in the comments below. How'd you feel about this volume of Berserk? I love all of you so much. Please be safe. GB out.